you're working on today, right? Well, I just got back from the vineyard, which is why my face is really red. Um, it's really hot out there right now. <laughs> um, so, um, but we also are um, doing a sparkling program at Adelaida. So today we started our triage. So we're just kind of checking the bricks and starting that fermentation. And then it will go into bottle on Monday. So, oh, wow. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, it's really cool. We've been, this is our third year now that we've done, so 2019 will be the third vintage um, of it. And then the first vintage we sent to Rack and Riddle, but the last two we've been able to do here and store in house. So really exciting. Yeah. yeah. So you do, you're doing the, you're doing dosage and everything there? Yeah. So um, there's a um, gentleman that has a mobile like sparkling bottling line. It's kind of like a one man show. And he yeah. is from here and I believe he's also gone to Alta Kalina as well. Um, so, and he will come to us on Monday. So hopefully everything will. He's the same guy. He does Jack Creek Stellars too, I think. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, cool. So that's kind of what we did today. That's great. Yeah, people are way too uh, way too versatile in this area. Yeah, <laughs> I, I feel so simple when uh, when I start talking about some of these projects that other people are doing. Well, the sparkling is really exciting. I'm very happy. Yeah. Like, especially at you know um, with you know the high amount of acid that Adelaide loves and has in all of our wine, it's like super perfect for um, sparkling. So I think it'll be awesome. And we have we're using the HMR Pinot too. So the 54 year old vines um, to make that um, sparkling. So that's cool. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll admit freely that uh, when I get home, uh, I go to sparkling wine. That's kind of my, yeah. it's not <laughs> it's not a big, huge red sometimes. You know, we're working on that at, at, at work and then you just want yeah. something nice and light and uh, with some acidity to cut, you know, uh, cut through some of the stuff we were working on that day and, and, yeah. and some freshness. So yeah, no, that's awesome. I'm jealous. Alrighty, we're getting a few people coming on to Zoom. Uh, and then we've got, uh, looks like already a good crowd over on uh, Facebook. So get rolling here. You get nervous, Josh? Always. People watching you. Yeah. Yeah, but like you don't know people are watching you. So. Yeah, oh, I know, I know they're watching me. <laughs> <laughs> we do know that they're watching, but they're just kind of like beyond. Yeah. <laughs> no, if even if there were zero people watching me, I would make up, I would make them up in my mind that they're watching me. <laughs> but they're also watching you, which is great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Carl, how's your how's your sparkling program coming? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> we we so we briefly talked about it but um I don't know. another whole project i'm not sure i'm ready for i know right that's uh, that's what i'm saying it's it's uh but it is it is the thing to do i mean it sounds like you know ryan you guys are ahead of the curve everybody else is jumping on in the last years so. yeah. yeah and i think so we did a vintage in 17 but we're we're gonna age it for three years um so um and then we'll do the riddling um so this 2017 we will riddle next year or no so 2017 is being bottled um and then we'll get sent back sent back down to us but, yeah yeah i i'd really like uh we've, we've talked about just for kind of fun as a little bit of hobby and to see how it works out is doing some pet nap yeah and, um you know either from grenache viognier or something something maybe a blend you never know um and then uh and just trying to be you know, minimal or, 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 or zero on the sulfur and, and, but try to get it as clean as we can at the same time and, and just show that, uh, we can have a clean product at the end of it. But, um, yeah, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how it goes again, adding another project to the, to the background. It's yeah. kind of scary. So, so we are just about at three Oh five. So I think we'll kick it off. We've got a nice crowd over on the Facebook live side of things. And it looks like our crowd over here on zoom is still growing. Uh, so welcome everyone. Thanks for tuning in again and coming to hang out at this Paso Wine Hangout. Um, Chris Toronto with the Paso Robles Wine Country Alliance. Thank you again. Thanks. It uh, looks like we got a few of our regulars on. Michael Higgins is back. We got Steve and Martha Hewitt from Columbus, Ohio uh, back on watching again and a few other names that I, I tend to recognize over here on the right. Paul Maynard and Mike Wilkie and a few other people that we've seen uh, tune into the show. 
Uh, so thanks uh, for uh, the Zoom people and thank you everybody over on Facebook. So let's get rolling. Uh, today we are talking about technology in the vineyard. Uh, we are going to have uh, three people talking a little bit about, well, not just the vineyard, but also the crush pad and say the lab and just all around everywhere in wine in, in the wine making process on how technology comes to play. I think in the 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 uh, teaser pit that piece, sorry, that I have uh, over on our website, it says something about the art and science of winemaking. And I guess you could say, yeah, there is a lot of art, but there is a lot of science. And that's definitely what we're going to be talking about. <laughs> I have three uh, winemakers on uh, today from, again, three different brands that we've not seen previously. i uh, going to talk about this. We have uh, Josh Hart from Jada Vineyard joining us, Ryan Bosk from Adelaide Vineyards and Winery joining us, and Carl Bowker from Kaliza Winery joining us. I want to give them a, each a moment to, I was going to kick it off with Carl. Ah, there he is. Ah, I'm here. <laughs> I was ducking out, Chris. I was getting nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I want to give each of them a moment to say hello, talk about their who they are and their brand. Carl, kick it off for us. Yeah, so Carl Bowker with Kaliza Winery. Uh, we're um, primarily an estate-driven uh, program here in, in Paso. We uh, we have a 21-acre vineyard on the east side in the Willow Creek, I'm sorry, in the west side in the Willow Creek district. Um, you know, just, uh, just uh, you know, you said there's a lot of science, we're gonna talk a lot about the sciences of winemaking, but I consider us craft winemakers mostly, but we use these tools that are now available to us, both in the vineyard and in the winery. But really primarily, I think we're craft. We're a craft producer. We really, really hone in and make it about, um, not about the numbers necessarily, but about making you know the best uh, perceived wine and uh, from, from our estate vineyards. So small producer, we're only about 3000 cases of wine total. Um, and we keep it that way so that we can uh, spread our time between all the all the necessary tasks in the vineyard and in the winery as well. Cool. Thanks, Carl. Uh, let's go over to Ryan. Ryan with Adelaide Vineyards and uh, Winery. Welcome. Hi there. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, so Ryan and Adelaide Vineyards and Winery. Um, we are one of the um, oldest uh, wineries still operating here in Paso Robles. Um, family owned uh, estate uh, organically farmed fruit, uh, really concentrating on, you know, doing the best by our community, our um, environments and by our um, coworkers as well. So, yeah. Cool, right on. Thanks, Ryan. And last but not least, Josh Harp from Jada Vineyard, who you're, Josh, so I see Carl is in the barrel room. Looks like Ryan is uh, over in her lab. Yes. <laughs> Which is in the lab. Josh, <laughs> and welcome. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Yeah, I am, uh, I'm not working right now. I'm on vacation, actually. So sort of a half vacation, if you will, working vacation, if you will. So, uh, but uh, I wanted, this is one of my favorite subjects. So I appreciate you having, uh, having me uh, on and, and talking about um, technology. It's, it's definitely one of the things that uh, I geek out the most and you'll catch me, you know, talking, uh, you know, uh, during the day for the most part about. Um, yeah, so I'm again, I'm the winemaker at Jada Vineyard Winery. We're uh, about a 45 acre planted uh, estate vineyard. Um, our, uh, our taste room's right in the middle of our vineyard and we're also, not too far from Carl. We're just a little bit more west in the Willow Creek District. And um, we specialize or focus on uh, Rhone and Bordeaux style blends. Um, sometimes we throw in some, some varietal uh, wines like Tanat. So we have some, some interesting offerings at the, at the winery. And we're also about the same size as well. We're you know, about 3,000 cases annually, um, most of it through the tasting room. Um, you know, 95 plus percent is uh, going to our tasting room or through a, to our wine club. Great. And you, you know, you said that this subject is uh, like something you, you like to geek out on. And I'll tell everybody this subject uh, this time around came from Josh, actually, because we were sitting there, we were chit chatting about just other things and shows and whatever. And he said, how about how about this idea? And what I really found really cool about him pitching this idea is, is that if I were to pick Jada for something, it would probably be about biodynamic farming. But Josh is pretty passionate about also how they incorporate, and which is, as, as you know, biodynamic is not necessarily uh, about, you know, the, the perfect science necessarily or technology anyway in the form of science, but rather a, a, a little bit of uh, that kind of um, 
I don't, I don't know, I guess you could say that other side of science where science meets art, right? And, and, uh, and so Brian, or I'm sorry, Josh, when we first spoke about this, you said that you use these things called these soil probes in your vineyard and Carl, I understand you use them too, but um, talk a little bit about what that does in your process and maybe even how that mirrors or marries with uh, the biodynamic farming process. Sure. So I should probably um, uh, explain a little bit about the biodynamic as well. So uh, we're, we're definitely um, something what we've dabbled in is, is the biodynamic farming. Um, but uh, I would say it's more difficult to truly grasp biodynamic farming than it is a lot of this technology and stuff that we use in the winery. So um, you would need like twice the many degrees to truly understand. So that's why there's a lot of consulting that goes into biodynamic farming. So like, we like to think that we, uh, we, we sprinkle a lot of uh, biodynamic farming on top of organic uh, vineyard practices, which is something that we can say we've definitely been using um, over, for the last five years. Uh, we're not yet certified, but it's something that we're moving towards, um, something we've kind of wanted to prove to ourselves as um, you know, something that we're capable of doing consistently before we try to um, actually get certified. So, and we've been successful at doing that and adding in some of that biodynamic practices as well. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's a really interesting, um, you would think that they wouldn't work together, you know, biodynamic farming, organic farming, and, uh, and, and the science and the technology that we use out there. But um, I think what's key is what you see with some of the uh, soil moisture probes, for instance, that you brought, that you spoke of, um, we can see a um, influence from what the practice we're, we're using out in the vineyard. Uh, whether that be soil moisture retention, um, you, you know, I, I like, you know, whether we're getting penetration of, uh, of rain into the ground, you know, we're not having compacted soils because um, we're not tilling, um, you know, every year. So we're, we're usually tilling, you know, maybe three, three to five years. Um, and we also have a really good uh, um, ecological health of the vineyard that allows for um, porosity in the soil for um, some soil moisture retention again and and uh, and also just um, uh, biological health in, in the soil um, so yeah that's that's kind of the key the the key reasons that we focus on on, on the science and how we're able to um, you know relate the two of them or correlate the two of those practices hey, so Josh we all I think all three of us farm organically right and for a while so tell us how what's that what's that extra added piece that that little piece of voodoo that the biodynamics brings to the table i'm just kidding when i say that but you know what is what it is in your mind that brings that extra little wh why does bio why take that next step to biodynamics uh, sure organic farming is all about soil health and the, and the vineyard health and the and the property health and the health of all of us that work in the, and the health of the ecosystem as a whole. Yeah. Know. So, but I think a lot of people would want to understand what it is. What is that? That I don't, and I don't want to say it's like a, a step up, but what is when you say that I go from organics to biodynamic farming? What is? What do you see that being? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question, Carla. Um, I think uh, a lot of it is is more of a, men, a mentality that you have to um, appreciate. And uh, again, I, I, you know, I'll never say that we're implementing or, or even using biodynamics in, in a, a truly expert way, if you will. Um, but again, we're, we're falling back if, if we have to on our organic uh, practices. But something I've learned from utilizing the techniques in biodynamic farming is kind of more of an ecological awareness. Um, you know, again, what can we use or what can we not use that has the same effects as um, either organic or, or then following that commercial products that we use for, um, you, you, know, uh, you know, powdery mildew or um, e even foliar nutrient ap applications. So, um, but again, I, the way I look at it is uh, I'm especially interested in, in soil health. Um, so making sure that we are, you know, we can, we can show uh, microbial health, um, again, higher retention of nutrients in the soil that we're not having to add artificially, even if it is organic. Um, and so I think, uh, again, it comes down to kind of a mentality of you really have to be out there in the vineyard every, every day, um, as, you, as I'm sure you are as well, Carl, but uh, you're looking at it from a, you know, did this work, um, 
you know, did this not work? What, you know, what do I have to change? Um, uh, as far as the tea preparations, um, and, uh, and some of the other ground uh, applications that we can do. Um, and then, uh, then we also just look at whether timing of things makes a huge difference. Uh, you know, not sticking to a particular schedule that maybe is recommended by the, uh, the companies that, you know, produce the organic or again, commercial, if you're using commercial products, um, and, and just being more in tune with the vineyard and, and, and what it's telling you. And as a, as a, as a whole, you know, uh, in, including, you know, when you're looking at the canopy, uh, what can the ground tell you? So, um, it's, again, it's kind of mental. I know I'm probably not making, uh, you know, I don't have any hard, uh, evidence. Um, but again, it's more of a mentality of, of being in tune with the vineyard and, and again, the ecological health of the, the entire system. Well, if I, you know, if I could just chime in, I, w I mean, I look at it as, you know, we, we are fully organic and go, or we are organic oriented because it's our holistic way of doing things. And then the, the biodynamic piece, adding those biodynamic crashes, is you're just putting more, you know, more of what nature would pretty much do on its own. I mean, you're helping that or that holistic approach to the, the land and the farm and the, and, and having allowing it to have longevity because I mean we all know but a lot of people maybe listening don't know but you know we're taking away from the soil we're taking away from the vineyard every year when we're growing things nitrogen and lots of other things and so it has to go back another for another for our, uh, another for our farms to be sustainable or be long lasting and what we're trying to do is put it back in an organic or holistic way through organic farming and biodynamic practices um, so it's just extending that holistic approach. Right. And I think yeah. That, yeah, I mean, I would say that as far as, you know, taking something away from the soil and what you would then want to feed it, it's just, you know, we want to create an environment in which you're able to get the best fruit and the best product as possible, you know, so, and that's important when bringing it back to the winery because, you know, I was always taught that 80% of wine making happens in the vineyard. And so, there's a whole lot of, you know, work that needs to be done in the vineyard so you can then get, you know, the best product possible in order to be able to, you know, really show lines that have sense of place and where they're from. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I'm curious as to how the tool itself, by the way, works. This, these moisture probes, I mean, in my mind, I'm picturing you've got some metal thing like you, you would put maybe like in your steak to tell you that it's, you know, giving you some numbers of some sort. And, but um, I mean, talk, can, can you describe it for everybody watching who maybe doesn't know exactly what this tool kind of looks like and all of that? I'm going to also put a picture of your vineyard up for you. Okay, sure. Yeah, so uh, we have about six soil moisture probes on, on the property. And, and um, yeah, you, you kind of nailed it, uh, Chris. They're, they basically look like uh, little meat testers or thermometers. So um but uh, they're a little bit bigger. They're, they go down to about 48 to, to 56 inches uh, down into the soil. Um, and they have uh, sections along the length of the, of the probe that can measure the soil moisture at, at different depths. Um, in fact, where, this, where you're seeing here, this picture here, we have a weather station off to the right and a soil moisture probe off to the left. You can't see them on the picture here, but um, the key is, uh, is adding, is having as many soil moisture probes as you need for your your landscape or your your, um, your soil profiles or soil types, and you can see here in our picture at Jada, we you know this is kind of a, a, a rolling hill down into the fog. So, um, as you can imagine, the the soil types are are, are pretty different. Um, so it's important to have as much information as possible and not use just one probe or one um, you know piece of piece of information to to make your decisions. Um, Does it read onto your phone or something, or where where do you where do you see the yeah, data? exactly. So so um, it actually sends a graph of uh, the different moistures at every I think eight four to eight inches all the way down to the the, the last um, depth that it can read, and we can actually access it on any any laptop. Uh, I can access it on my phone as well wherever I am in the world, um, so we can make important decisions um, in real time. And, and again, what we're looking at is, um, you know, how much soil moisture is there? And, uh, and more importantly, is the root system actually utilizing the moisture at those particular depths? Um, and, uh, you know, it, we happen to see because some of our vines are almost 20 years old, maybe 20, yeah, 20 years old. 
Um, the root system is, is well below the limit of the probes. And we can actually see activity on those graphs that the roots are, are utilizing the water at those uh, particular depths. So um, it's really helpful when we are looking at um, sustainable irrigation practices because we do have the ability to irrigate. Um, but uh, it's really important to know what your timing for irrigation is going to be, how long you want to irrigate, and, uh, and, and again, how you can change that throughout the vineyard so you're not, you know, cropping, or sorry, farming your crop in uh, exactly the same way across um, each block. So um, that's a great way to yeah. be mindful. I wanted to take a moment to point out for everybody where, so where in Willow Creek you are. So if you're following my cursor and you're able to see this, well, we're pretty much talking just about right where, like above, right between the L and the I, I think is right about where Jada uh, is. Um, with the, uh, in, up in the Adelaida district, where Adelaida uh, is, is right about where the S is or so, maybe maybe the I right in after that big turn, right? Yeah. Uh, and then over in the Willow Creek district, once again, uh, where uh, Carl is, I think it's right in that little, notch where um, the Templeton Gap District kind of comes in and comes out or, or ends, if, if you will, somewhere right in there. Is that right, Carl? Yeah, I actually think it's a little bit further towards the S in Paso, uh, Paso Robles there. Oh, over here? Oh, on the other side or of the it. S and K. Okay. Yeah, it's on the other Got side it. of yeah. that little cutout for Templeton oh, Gap. Oh, right, because that's Bethel and then that goes to... Right. Yeah, right. That, that's Arbor Road, which you were pointing Arbor, to. Arbor, right. Yeah. Uh, so a little so bit on further this west than that. So that gives you an idea. And then uh, what I find interesting with um, the, for the soil types anyway, and you were talking about your soil type and that you irrigate sometimes, that you do have a majority of this kind of calcareous product, right? That exert not product, but rock or soil that exists down in your soil. And if, uh, if you've watched for, uh, previous shows, we've talked a lot about how porous this stuff is and how it retains uh, a lot of water. Uh, and so it's interesting that uh, you're, you're still, you know, you're, you're wanting to understand and know how much moisture may exist and other elements uh, down in your soil. And when you have these types of, of soils that uh, oftentimes lead to lesser irrigation in, in most cases, in most cases, not all. I think that, you know, at Adelaide, we use a uh, tule, which is a vapotranspiration. So one of the things that it does measure is the um, soil moisture, but also the evaporation from the plant. So you're able to understand what kind of water is in the atmosphere and what's being released from the plant. So then you know what you might need to actually put back into the plant. And all sorts of these tools are so important as, you know, our climate is changing and as it's getting hotter and hotter and we're trying to find more responsible ways to grow and produce great wine. It's it's really important to, you know, not just have like irrigation on timers and just have them go off no matter what kind of weather you're having and what kind of, you know, you know, soil moisture that you have. It's, it's super great and important. And, you know, it means that we're moving in a direction in which we're able to grow grapes with a little bit less water. So, yeah. So Ryan, while you're talking and, and in a way we're, we're kind of moving from the vineyard then to the crush pad actually, uh, and to talk a little bit about now, now the fruit has come off and maybe another kind of element that, uh, or tool that we use uh, to produce some of this really great fruit after we've taken so much time and effort into growing good fruit, what do we do with it next? Uh, talk a little bit about, uh, about what- Yeah, so um, at Adelaide, um for our red varietals, um, we do do a um, full cluster, which means we do keep some of the berries attached to um, the cluster itself and we don't remove the stems, um, but we um, do uh, de-stem some of our clusters, the majority of them, and they go through what's called for us an optical sorter. So this is kind of a picture that I show that it's just what our beautiful berries look like after they get through the optical sorter. So I feel like um, in some instances at a lot of wineries, you may have seen videos or pictures of, you know, eight to 10 people on two different levels um, with their faces stuck down with, you know, their hands picking out all sorts of different things that we would call mog. 
and mog is sort of um, bits of leaves, um, little bits of jacks or the rapis that's still stuck to the berry, um, or also maybe a little bit shriveled or raisins or maybe shot berries, which are just small berries that haven't ripened yet. Um, and so, you know, you can have people standing over a shaker table staring at this table um, for a decent amount of time trying to pick these out. And um, we have an optical sorter um, that kind of does this process for us. Uh, it's all based on size and weight. Um, uh, yeah, so it uses air to kind of push back these rejected berries or berries that don't meet a, like, previously set option on the machine. So we do have it preset to all of our different bridles. So we definitely, when we got it in 2014, there was a bit of a trial run with every single varietal that we had. And, and we keep changing it as the years go on, as the size of our berries differ. Um, but we usually have it set particularly to that varietal. So once it weighs, once it sees a berry um, or senses a berry that's of a different color, maybe it's green and it hasn't really developed all the way or it hasn't gotten that pigment, um, or it's a little bit smaller than sort of those preset um, size berries that we um, set it for, it'll shoot gusts of air that will then push back those rejected berries. And so what falls into our bin that we then put into our tank are those sort of more perfect berries. <laughs> Although there's no such thing as all perfect berries, um, you know, it definitely helps sort of in that process. Um, yeah, so we're able to get a little bit, you know, more round blueberries. <laughs> um, Do you go yeah. back through and sort the stuff that gets air pushed out? No, so we, that we usually don't end up using that. So that's sort of like the, what I was saying is sort of like what we would discard or, you know, consider unusable. We have in the past, um, you know, tried to do fermentations with those just because I don't like to waste. Um, so I think that we have done that. But as you can imagine, if you have sort of um, riper fruit that gets uh, pushed back, um, more raisins, you're getting higher sugars, and then you're getting more alcohol, and then you're just having more trouble as the fermentation process continues. So those usually aren't as successful for us. Um, but we definitely have tried in the beginning to keep that just to make sure that, you know, it is making a difference, obviously. So, you know, by removing those, we can, you know, tell a difference in the quality of the wine. Um, so it's definitely a great tool to have. And the one that we have specifically does have a shaker um, table that goes down towards the threshold. Um, I don't have a video of it, which is weird. You feel like I would have taken a video. But um, so, um, so it has sort of a shaker table that pushes the single berries down and then you get to sort of a threshold where when it dips, that's when it gets that burst of air that pushes that berry back or that lets the perfect berries fall. Um, and that shaker table also has little slits in it as well. So that's very convenient for as it's shaking any of those bits of leaves or any of that bits of the cluster that's still attached to the berry um, can fall through those little slits as well. Um, or maybe those smaller undeveloped berries can also do that as well. And then also, as you're going through this process, as you can imagine, some of the berries are breaking and creating some sort of juice. Um, and we're able to retain that juice. There's a juice pan at the bottom of it. So that then goes into a drum for us that we can then choose to, you know, put back um, into the tank as well after it's done. So we are, you know, it's, it's been super successful for us. It's cut down on labor. It's also, you know, kind of made it so much easier for us to kind of fine tune what is actually going into the tank um, and really helped with sort of our fermentation and microbial stability as well. So, yeah. Clearly, um, the, the, clearly the number one goal here is better wine and better fruit that's going into the tank. Yeah. It goes back to that sustainability thing and, and the, the practices that we all practice, uh, you know, carry on in the vineyard, but it's the sustainability of labor too. And, and uh, it's just fewer bodies you have to have that those people can be doing other things. And that's a little bit more effective for the company. These are not, these, these optical sorters are not inexpensive pieces of equipment. 
over over a course. I mean, I know Josh. I don't have one. Do you? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, over, over the course of time, they, they would. <laughs> have one, but. <laughs> uh, but really cool technology. It's this is where you know the science of being able to to read and censor those things and push out stuff that Josh and I are man and crews manually pull out. Yeah. Um, it was just moving the wine industry uh, to higher and higher qualities with those technological advances. Yeah, and sort of dealing with the elements that were being dealt, obviously, the warmer climates and less water and, you know, labor is, you know, shorter to come by and, you know, can become more and more expensive, which is great. I mean, everybody should get paid, you know, you know what they're worth and what it's with, you know, that minimum wage, but or higher. So like, it's definitely like, it's just us kind of dealing with things changing and being able to, you know, still make, you know, great wine um, using the technology, technological advances we have. Yeah. Did you, I just, I just want to ask a quick question. Have you found that uh, when you first started out, did you take the machine like to 11 when it came to like rejecting, uh, you know, certain yeah. things or did have you dialed it back? Have you found that you've dialed it back at all? Um, well, I will say that it's interesting because I've been here, so I've been at Alabama since 2016. Um, so I'm sure that we all dealt with the 2017, those, you know, really hot days. And a lot of people were picking fruit that wasn't pristine and that definitely like suffered from even, even our soil probes and our, our tooling system and how we measure all of this couldn't have told us that you have plenty of water in your soil, but the sun is going to be so hot for 11 days that it doesn't matter if you put water in the soil. It's just going to shrivel and you're going to have these kind of issues because it's fruit. I mean, what would happen if you sat outside, even if you had plenty of water, the same thing would happen. And so in 17, it was really interesting because you know, in previous vintages and then from 18 and 19, it's been extremely um, helpful to have this optical sorter. And then in 17, we definitely had to dial it back a little bit just because their berries were so much smaller, which is fantastic and loads of concentrated fruit and, you know, great punches of acidity, but also um, a lot more dimpling in the berries than we're used to and a lot more shrivel and like we were ending up losing too much of the crop and too much of the yield. Um, so dialing it back on some of the varietals was necessary in order to make up wine. <laughs> so like there were definitely th times in which we've gone back and forth, um, but 17 was kind of the, you know, the year that we were happy to have it, but also ended up having to do a little dialing back on sure. the sides of the berry. Yeah. And then oftentimes we'll, it's preset to varietals. So when we're using, picking our Pinot, we have it set to that, uh, Syrah, Zinfandel, Cabernet. Um, so sometimes we'll change it up. So for Syrah, we might rather it be set for the Pinot setting or if we feel like we're getting smaller berries, you know, we can adjust it to a different varietal just to also help it run smoother as well. Um, so obviously I, the max the machine can go is five tons per hour, but we are, you know, we want to have a little bit more of a controlled environment and we don't want to break all the berries because we like to ferment with full berries. So we'll set it to a lot slower um, just to be able to retain those full berries as they go into the tank. Cool. I'm sold. <laughs> I know. I bet everybody. Right, else. I know everybody probably. Yeah, you want to? You want to sell one? We're we're, we're, <laughs> we're looking. We we talked about uh, getting a video of of this guy at work, but uh, it sounds like we couldn't find one that was kind of. I mean, yeah, it's like not our optical sorter, and the one that I could just that's on the website is a much larger winery that has like an auger kind of going down into the top of it and. That was like two minutes long too. So. Yeah. <laughs> Carl, you know, Carl, Carl touched upon this. Later yeah. During harvest. Yeah. Maybe next time. Yeah. Cause I don't know about there you go. everything going uh, on right now, but yeah. <laughs> so that fruit gets in and um, that's a good question. Steve Hewitt says, what is an optical? You don't want to know. Cost. 
I don't think anybody really wants to know. <laughs> I don't even know. <laughs> I mean, I'd exactly. be able to get, but I didn't see the for that one, so. <laughs> yeah, in the tens of thousands, if not more. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> we get the fruit. Now it comes into the, the to the winery. We we start into fermentation, or maybe even before picking the fruit. Uh, there are a lot of decisions that are being made that Carl is going to talk a little bit about through what would be called phenolics and and back it up a little and, and talk a little bit about first off what is phenolics and then if you wouldn't mind then going into what what the measurement and and what those what that means basically well yeah sure happy to and you know in 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 brief basically phenolics are, are just uh, organic compounds that are in uh, uh, fruit clusters or fr uh, fruit itself and we're just trying to measure things like tan col color levels um, basically these are the two T factors we're looking at and it isn't just it doesn't just happen when it gets into the winery we make harvest decisions based on what the the phenolic development what the uh, this is just a, a graft of uh, actually some clusters of fruit before we harvested to determine you know we all we test the fruit um, send it up to this. There's several labs that do this. We happen to use this company, Enologics, um, but uh, and they all all have each one of their several of them. Each one of them has a different sort of system that they measure. There are a lot of similarities in what they're measuring. And but the, the key things are, as you can see, tannins there uh, and anthocyanins, which are this the the the, the level of color. So the key factors for us are the, is the tannin levels and the complex anthocyanins the, and total anthocyanins. Um, we're looking to make to get those numbers to a certain level knowing we have enough bound color in our fruit when it comes in, um, color in general, the anthocyanins, and how the color will bind with tannins during the fermentation process. And so we want to make sure we have tannins at a certain level and color at a certain level so that we end up with dark Darker wine, the darker, uh, I mean, it, whether whether or not you agree or disagree with it, but the general public buys wine based on color. The darker it is, the better they think it is. I don't necessarily uh, agree to that necessarily, but that's a factor we look at. But more importantly, the, the more things, the more color types, the tannins, the, the, more, um, the more rich and round characteristic, the more lush, plush characteristic you're gonna have in your wine. So if you're looking to develop big, rich, round, wines um, and, and and quite frankly some of these tools don't work with all grape varieties and we don't bother to do an, an, an analysis on our Grenache because it's a lighter color variety and it, this the system really doesn't work with it. But the key thing about you know people banter around you know we, we, we make one using phenolics it's a, it's a big spectrum of things it's very uh, at times can be very complicated even for me even though I've been using it for years but the key factor is to determine when is the right ripening. We even talked to the 2017 vintage and how um, how uh, everybody was picking because they thought we were getting shriveled grapes. But in some some of our cases, we really weren't the phenolic development level that we wanted. So we we even though the fruit might have been shriveling up a little bit, but we we left on a little bit longer. But um, the two key points are. You know, using this technology, using these laboratory methodologies that have been developed in the last five or six, seven, eight, ten years, um, to just be able to grow and grow better fruit and determine the appropriate harvest time, and then to be able to monitor it as it's in the, the tanks or vats or whatever, whatever you're fermenting in small lots in in open top barrels, whatever the case may be, um, how that how the color and the tannins are binding. And you, you just want to make sure that you know you don't over exceed any. You don't extract more tannins during fermentation you want because nobody wants a ridiculously tannin tannic wine. Um, so uh, yeah, it's just another tool. Uh, as I said early on, I mean you know we really are. I like I like to believe in at Calista work more in the along the line of craft winemaking. Really, does it taste like we want it to taste? Does it look? Does it smell like we want it to, it to be? But all these tools we're talking about today, all these scientific and technological advances that allow us to just get one step closer to where we want to be, are, um, it's really cool to have those tool, 
tools in your toolbox, um, but not necessarily uh, do all on any one of them. I don't know if that made a bit of sense, but that's, that's how I look at it. Yeah. Um, so what are we looking at here though, Carl? Because I wanted to make sure we tapped onto uh, just a quick glimpse of your vineyard before we talk about the yeah. wines that you're, you guys are sipping on. So, um, so this is a shot from uh, uh, the eastern side of our vineyard looking across our, our, um, our terraced area where we actually grow our grenache. So those curved vines there is where it's our grenache that we grow in a, a head train uh, format. Um, and then we tie them up as, the, as they say in, in French, we tie them up into goblets or goblets. So that's what you're looking at there. But the more important thing, because the wine we're going to taste is a, is a Cabernet Syrah blend or companion blend, that block right behind those terraces is one of our many uh, Syrah blocks on the ranch. And the Syrah and, uh, and Cabernet are two perfect varietal examples of where the phenolic testing and the phenolic analysis really come into play because they both tend to have high tannins and high color concentration. Um, let's start with what uh, we're drinking. Uh, we can still continue the conversation and, and especially on how these tools may have come into play with these particular wines. But I thought, Carl, you could kick it off a little bit in talking about uh, the, this first wine, the Companion. So here's all three wines together that uh, well, cool. we're, we're having. So this is uh, this that the, the, the four of us are tasting, and I don't think anybody else is tasting this wine because it is uh, not yet been released. It's uh, in yes. late, all right. late September, October. Um, but this is the yeah, this is the wine we call Companion, where we we pair up the uh, uh, as good companions Cabernet Sauvignon and, and Straw. Um, those of you who know Calise, though, I mean, we're really more of a rum producer than we are a Bordeaux producer. But over the course of time, we've had some Cabernet in our program, both in our vineyards and Cabernet um, in the wine program. But we've always paired these two varieties together. And I picked this particular wine because, again, these are the, these are the in in my mind, these are the two varieties that we use um, and monitor the the phenolic development in clusters and in the, in the tanks. Um, because the, the system works well with these. They, they build high tannins, high color, and then we find them. And I actually brought this one a little bit. Um, this, this uh, I don't know how many millions of people are listening, so I don't know. I'm just kidding. Uh, billion. Billion. Um, I actually brought this in honor of Josh because, and this is, this is uh, uh, because there's a little bit of Jada wine, fruit wine, Cabernet in this wine. And it's all about the, it happened all about the phenolics. We, we use the Cabernet that we made that we, uh, mo for the most part, the Cabernet we use nowadays is purchase Cabernet. Um, we, we put the wine together that we thought would be the wine based on what we uh, had fermented and put together. And it did not have the, the numbers that we wanted it to. It didn't have the, the, the tannin levels that we wanted it to. So Josh at the time, Josh, I hope you don't mind if I'm saying this, but Josh was selling a little bit of Cabernet Sauvignon. He made a little bit more than Jada needed that year. And so we were able to cut by a couple of barrels of Cabernet from, from Jada and incorporated in this wine and improve our numbers. And, and I don't know for the you know, four of us that are tasting this, I mean, we really became a, uh, it was a beautiful wine before, it just became more lush and rich and plush. And as a friend of mine says, unctuous, um, and, uh, and, and so using those tools allowed us to say, we can make this wine better. What is available to us? We looked in our own toolbox. We didn't have, uh, we didn't, we always want to make this a little more cab than Syrah or fairly equal, equal parts. So we didn't have any more cab to add, but, you know, Jada had a couple of barrels that we could purchase and, and, and it, it enhanced the wine. We didn't want to add more Syrah. So that's why. That's why we're tasting this wine today, because it, you know, it, it, it's that flavor. Yeah, yeah. I won't, I, I won't say that uh, it's just because of Jada, Carl, but uh, you could see that your, um, you have that roundness, that softness you're going for. But uh, and it's something to explain to to everyone listening is, is softness doesn't mean there's a lack of of density and a lack of uh, of mouthfeel. So I mean, you, and you have it all here, which is which is really awesome, and clearly something that could probably age really well too. 
um, you know, you're not having to wait forever to, to enjoy this bottle for sure. And I, I just wanted to comment on the, the, the beautiful fruit that also is not aromatic. It's aromatically, but also finishes with fruit, which is like super important to me and any wine, you know, I want it to finish with sort of, um, I want it to finish with the fruit. Like I wanted to have that really nice lush, you know, finish. Um, and it's really nice. It's, you can tell that, you know, that it's been worked on. It's really great. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, it's a really elegant wine, Carl. Um, and it, it, it has such a great mouthfeel. It's a, it has like the, this bit of firmness that kind of washes away and it's just beautifully round. And ending with that fruit that Ryan was just saying, it's just, it definitely has this really great long finish that uh, it's just beautiful. It's a great wine. Thank you. Oh, appreciate yeah. you saying that. Those, yeah, those are all things we try to build into our wine is the, the finish, the showcasing the fruit. I mean, we, let's face it, we're growing in Paso Robles, so we have the ability to get nice flush flush uh, fruit and we should really showcase it and we just make sure that all the other components pair well and are balanced into it and uh, um so yeah this is this is our this is our goal and i, I think we really hit, hit the nail on the head with this one right on that's great yeah, absolutely um we have a uh syrah grenache blend up next from jada uh which is called hell's kitchen 2017. Oh, no, I'm sorry, not Grenache. Oh, yeah, Grenache, Graciano, Viognier, I'll put it up. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, this uh, this blend changes year to year, but the idea behind it is kind of to do a Paso version of a GSM. So um, some years it's more Grenache than Syrah, but uh, lately we've been really enjoying the, the higher percentage of Syrah. Um, and there's also Graciano that we, because uh, we actually found that we have the uh, clone of, of um what we thought was Moved on the property that turned out to be Graciano that a lot of people have planted. So we've embraced it and now put Graciano on the label. And, uh, and sometimes we also have a little bit of Tanat and, and, and Viognier from our Syrah co-fermentation in there. So it's kind of, uh, um, it's a hodgepodge, but uh, with, a, with, a, with a goal in mind. Um, again, to kind of have a more new world style GSM. We do somewhere around 50, 50% 50 new oak on that, but usually between 350 and 500 liter barrels. Um, so a little bit larger format. And, uh, and then my goal with this one, even though it's 60% Syrah, is always to really showcase the Grenache in this blend. Um, I love the, you know, the candied, um, candied red fruit that you can get from Grenache uh, when, it's, when it's perfectly ripe and, um, and, and some of the beautiful, uh, you know, aromatics that you get from some stem inclusion as well. So um, I like to showcase that, but in a, in a, in a, in a subtle way, um, kind of have that as the backbone. And then the Syrah is sort of adding a little bit of, you know, richness and, and uh, some extra support from, uh, uh, you know, darker fruits and, and, and again, mouthfeel. So uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is kind of a blend of what we can do on the roads, Rhone side of, of the vineyard. Uh, from multiple, this, multiple yeah, I think this wine, it's beautiful. And yeah, I think this speaks perfectly to the 2017 conversation we were having. And I could understand why you would put more straw in it in this particular year, because 2017, the, the fruit and the wines that we produced, well, I'll speak for me, but the wines that we produced were a little bit lighter in style. And our GSM as well, the Asm blend, tested, it ended up with more Syrah in it than we normally would do as well, just to bolster and then make sure that it, it bookend or fit in between the other bookends, the 16s and the 18s, which are a little more bombastic and bigger, um, in the more bed, um, but, but, but a beautiful blend. Tell me why uh, you added a little white variety, the be on the age of this one. Well, again, so we have, um, it's a good question. We have three different colognes of Syrah um, on our property. So we have the Australia clone, the uh, clone 174 and uh, 383. Um, and so we, uh, we actually tend to uh, have the ability to harvest Syrah from the Estrella clone flock uh, at exactly the same time as our Viognier, which uh, the other two tend to come about two weeks after. So a significant difference in, in timing. And um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll harvest the Viognier if we have to and, and, and let it sit in the tank cold before we harvest the Syrah, but I, t I like to ferment uh, right away, um, or or within the, a, a similar time period as the Syrah. So we have the the the. We're fortunate to have a cologne that that we can pick 
um, and ferment with the Viognier as a, a kind of a coat roti style. Um, and that actually makes up a big chunk of our, our Jersey girl, as you, as you know. So it's actually um, has a huge chunk of Viognier in it. Um, but every so often, I love the freshness of, of that particular fermentation and, uh, and just the aromatic complexity you get from the co-fermentation. And so adding even, uh, what is it, 3% in here, um, it is, it's supporting some of those brighter, um, you know, more uh, brulee um, you know, tropical fruit characteristics that you're not normally going to find in, uh, in these other red varieties, but it's also not dominating the, the, the nose on it. So I'm, I'm really liking this mixture of these um, maybe uh, savory or a little bit more um, meteor aromatics and some mushroom that's from the Syrah, but also mixed with those tropical aromatics that are coming from the Viognier and then those candied um, flavors from the Grenache. And I think that that's one of the greatest things about co-fermenting the Vio as well is that sometimes Grenache can be um, a little bit uh, more of savory aromatics, a little bit more on our vineyard as well. So depending on the vintage co-fermenting Viognier can really help lift those sort of uh, brighter, fruitier, or more floral aromatics of Syrah. So it pairs really well with those um, savory aromatics as well. This is really good, yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, no, that's exactly, uh, that's exactly the goal. I mean, we're trying to, I love making things that kind of come in waves, uh, making wines that come in waves when you when you're trying it. So you're getting different levels of aromatics, you're getting different levels of, of flavor as it opens up. And, uh, and they all kind of open up at different times um, uh, without feeling disconnected. And they get more integrated as the age too, which I think uh, uh, I've also found that the Viognier just adds a, um, you know, a lovely characteristic uh, over time. You know, six years in bottle is kind of where I would prefer everyone to be tasting this, but it's not uh, realistically uh, achievable. So. Uh, but yeah, thank you. I'm glad you enjoy it. So next up uh, is the Adelaide Cabernet Sauvignon Viking Vineyard. I'll put a picture of the Viking Vineyard back up here in just a second. Uh, this one's a 2016, so we're talking the... the I know, I missed the memo about the... <laughs> Sorry. Vintage. Well, I brought the 16 because it was my first full vintage at Adelaide. So, I mean, I just had to you know, give myself a little boost there. So, um, but uh, yeah, so this is, so Viking Vineyard is two separate vineyards. Uh, this is actually Upper Viking, and then we do have uh, um, the original, or what we just call Viking, and then we'll call this one Upper Viking. So this is that 1,700 feet. Um, so as you can see by the terrain, um, slopes um, on both sides, um, and also super exposed. So we definitely um, do have shade cloth on the afternoon shot side of our uh, Cabernet, which is another, not really a technological advance, but definitely something that um, we're starting to use more and more as of course our climate changes and we're trying to make better wine in a changing climate. So um, we've done a lot of different things up at Upper Viking to kind of help mitigate the heat um, that we kind of experience here at the top. but. I do think that adds to um, the concentration of flavor and fruit um, in our Cabernet. Um, it also helps with our you know, small berries and um, therefore a little bit more concentration of skin, you know, more skin to less juice, uh, giving us um, you know, just overall uh, better color tannin and you know, kind of helping with those phenolic numbers that Carl was discussing. Uh, so yeah, um, the 2016 uh, Viking State Vineyard Cabernet. I, I, I love that you achieved, um, you know, still, it, you know, obviously it's not extremely old, but you know, as a 16, it's a little bit older than, than the wines that we presented and still lots of fruit, lots of, uh, but balance, you know, balance between nice savory earthy notes. Um, you know, it's, it's definitely, you know, when you taste it, it's definitely a Cabernet, which I think is, uh, is amazing, but uh, clearly, you know, perfectly That's right. Awesome. Cabernet. That's great. <laughs> I think sometimes oh. titles can get lost or muddied and totally. like being able to say that a wine has the varietal characteristics and it has sense of place is like, it's great. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, it definitely, it definitely has both of those. It's definitely a beautiful pasto cab. It's got, you know, beautiful, rich characteristics. Those three characteristics are there. You definitely know it's a cab because it's got great 
these are plush tannins, but they're they're, they're definitely noticeable. Um, yeah, of course, uh, yeah, you brought 16 rather than a 17. Give it a little more time with those tannins, for sure. Um, but uh, yeah, beautiful wine, Be and aromatically super, and I'm just going to keep smelling it. Yeah, the acid on it, too. I mean, I really, really want to eat something with this. <laughs> yeah, that's something so that I think delicious. that I feel like it might be the same in a lot of places in Paso, but like, we definitely don't have a shortage of acids in our wine, which like, I absolutely love. I, I don't, I, I would much rather have something that I feel like is just a tad too high acidic rather than like not enough acid. Because to me, I feel like, you know, there's great tannin and acid, but the acid is what helps retain that vibrancy as it ages. So I think that it's important, especially in a varietal that, that can be aged, you know, 10, 15, 20 years. You know, because we're um, an older winery here, I've had such a, you know, privilege of tasting like super vintage Cabernets from um, Adelaide and from the Viking Vineyard. Um, and I think it's that acidity that helps sort of retain that freshness as the wine ages. And it's exciting. And like just tasting the Cabernet berries, like so a lot of times when it's ripening and I'm walking through the vineyard, I have to stop myself from eating too many of them because obviously you get a little sick, but they are the most wonderfully like tasting berries that you know come from our estate and it's really exciting uh you know every year to make the cabernet it's great i think we all have he's talking about the acidity in this one and actually all three other ones and that is for all three uh all three brands all three of us as winemakers that's you know really really lucky we grow fruit and make wine where we do because these limestone shale soils and that cooling effect we have, the combination of those two just allow the natural acidity to, to remain in wine. I mean, so many of the wine regions, they have to acidulate wine, they have to add acid back to, to, to bring that brightness, and we can just do it naturally. And, and um, you know, just these are pure wines, these are what fruit products, and, um, uh, and, and you know, that, that acid, that brightness, that freshness really makes the wine uh, linger in your mouth as well as is that longevity as well, which is really important. Yeah, good. No, yeah, I, uh, you know, something to add to that. It was, uh, I think it was 2018 was a really into interesting vintage that showed how, um, you know, this, uh, this area can really um, hold that acid and also um, uh, make um, exceptional wines. And we had one of our blocks, our darkest block of Cabernet, again, using those phenolic numbers that you, you use, Carl. Um, our darkest block of wine uh, was, or our grapes, was showing that it was ripe and we were ready to pick, but it was 3.2 pH. Um, I don't know if you've seen anything that low, but it was, we, we, we should harvest this, but we're, we're so used to it now that um, that really, what, it didn't take long for us to kind of get over the you know, low number. That, and, and, and for those who uh, um, don't follow the pH of wines very much, that's, that's quite low for, to, for any variety. Um, but it makes for an amazing uh, blending grape, you know, even if you're blending to another clone of Cabernet, um, you can kind of nail that mouthfeel um, area that you want to be in, and, uh, but also retain a ton of, uh, you know, fruit and, uh, again, acidity and, and just age it a little bit longer in barrel and, and it ends up softening up and, and just making a, an amazing fresh, uh, fresh wine. Cool. You know, we're getting along in time here. I hate to say it. Uh, we do have one quick question. Uh, Josh, will you continue to produce the Graciano or will you graft over with something else? Oh, no, we're keeping that Graciano. That is, uh, if anything, we're putting more in, more in if we can. So, uh, you know, now we got to go hunt it down or, or, or do some field I know, grafting. That's that's we'll... <laughs> what was that? You get the Graciano and it ends up being what you thought the Graciano was. Before. Exactly, exactly. I, I like, I think it's, it's it, you know, it's, we loved it before we knew what it was, you know? So, yeah. um, and now that we know it, what it is, we love it even more because it's just being its own thing. Um, no, that's going to be, uh, we love co-fermenting. In fact, we do um, sometimes 50-50 co-fermentations with uh, one of our Syrahs. So, um, yeah, it's not going anywhere. Uh, we may have more planted. Uh, we have about 15 acres that we can plant. So, uh, it may show up uh, somewhere else in some different soil and, and we'll try it out and see how we use it. Cool. Well, yeah, we were talking about acidity. I mean, that you thought it was uh, Monastrell or Morved, uh, 
Graciano, but Graciano brings more acidity in the fruits of the yeah. table. So I can see why you, know, you would like to keep it and not have more freshness in the wine, especially when you're making bigger, like, small wines that are higher in pH. Exactly. It gives you the freedom to, uh, yeah, to, to co either co-ferment or blend with some Syrah that's maybe a little bit higher pH, maybe a little bit flabbier on the, on, on the acidity and um, kind of bring it back into the levels that we're, we're looking for. Now, I, I, it's, it's, kind of a, uh, it's kind of a perfect variety. Um, it's not for everybody, but um, we love it. We love it at Jada for sure. Right on. Well, you guys, I want to give you one more opportunity to um, maybe say what you're up to uh, right now. I don't know if you're doing any future virtual tastings or uh, anything like that. Um, Josh, I know you're on vacation, but you just got done bottling, so you're probably kind of... I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I don't know if you've got anything coming up anytime soon. Uh, you know, I think all of us are in the same boat right now. We're, we're looking at Verasion. Either Verasion's already started or uh, we're, we're waiting to see, you know, 80% in the vineyard. Um, so we'll be out there looking at that. Yeah. Something we didn't touch on uh, too much was that, you know, we're doing pyrometry um, out in the vineyard as well. So we're looking at, um, it, it's, it's a tool that we can use to actually manage the stress of each, or look at the stress of each plant. So we're going to see that through Verasion and just see kind of where we are because it's such a, um, uh, it's such a great milestone every year is, is for Asian that kind of determines where we're going to be, you know, the rest of the year. And then, um, yeah, bottling is done. We'll have 18. So uh, I'm trying to think we don't have any scheduled virtual tours, but uh, virtual uh, tastings, but we have the um, uh, ability for people to sign up for them, uh, you know, either, either privately or, or um, in groups as well. So All right. where do they do that? Uh, you go on to our website, and uh, I believe it should be offered as a virtual tour. Or easiest uh, is to call the winery and set it up with one of our uh, tasting room associates. Great, cool, thank you, Ryan. Uh, Ryan, congratulations! You just got married, and 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 yet you're here. You are with us. Uh, so and thank you for doing that. I don't know if you were. Supposed I got to married on a beach with far less people than it was originally planned. So I got okay. married in a very safe and responsible way. <laughs> I just want everybody to know that. <laughs> um, so that's what I did. But um, we also did our last modeling in June. So the month of July is definitely a sort of relaxing month for us here. Um, although duration happened and it like went through really fast. Like I was out in the vineyard on Monday before I took vacation and I was like, oh great, we have a couple weeks, we'll do some sampling, you know, we got, we got time and no big deal. And then I came back from vacation and like peanut, we've got some peanut blocks that are at 80, 85%, like we're going to be at a hundred next week. And I'm just, you know, it, everything just kind of happened really fast, which is great. I mean, Harvest is my favorite time of year, so I'm ready to, to I'm ready for it. I'm excited. So that's great. I think that that's definitely the, the biggest thing we got going on. And just, I'm, I, you know, I get to spend my mornings walking extremely steep slopes and um, looking at ripening fruit. So it's great. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Carl, what you got going on? Yeah, so lots of, lots of time in the vineyard, lots of time, uh, you know, uh, working with the crews and just fine-tuning the canopies right now and making sure that we don't have clusters sitting on top of clusters, that we have a lot of airflow and just all the important things that viticulture, uh, viticulture wise that we do in the vineyard is uh, spending a lot of time with that. Uh, sitting in the barrel room now, so here at the cellar, just uh, everything we can do to prep for uh, prep for the upcoming harvest, which we're going to We'd expect we'd sort of get the Viognier uh, at the end of the end of August to early September, so it's really right around the corner, just sort of working on all that stuff. And uh, uh, you mentioned virtual tastings. I mean, Cleese has gone into this program. We do lots and lots of virtual tastings. Uh, if anybody who's listening in hasn't uh, participated or really would like to, um, yeah, just go to our website, CleeseTheWinery.com go to the, uh, the wine section and you'll see that we have a little virtual tasting packets that we put together, small small portions of five different wines. We have a really, um, a very perfect turnkey program where we get those out to you, you know, even in hot state. We've uh, we worked really hard with some of our fulfillment uh, partners to get them packed and s safely sent. And then we'll sit here on Zoom with you uh, and, and these are uh, our Zoom uh, virtual tastings are actually 
um, the people you you put together. So it's not like we put uh, strangers together. So we're you know, and, and we started this back at the beginning of COVID because down the tasting room we're you know we're, we're now back open and and able to have uh, guests visit us albeit with outside tastings which are another cool experience um but the virtual tastings are just hugely successful because you can bring aunt you know aunt and uncle uh in in some other state together and you just bring family or friends together we're doing lots of these for corporations now um just a really cool thing and uh if if you haven't experienced one i, I highly encourage you whether it's one with Kaliza or one one of the other amazing Paso uh, producers that are doing these things. Uh, it's really a, a very intimate experience that you get to do. I mean, it's better to be face to face, but um, uh, we don't have to wear a mask when we do virtual tastings. Um, so we can, you can see my lips moving when I'm, when we're tasting wine together. Um, but anyway, it's, it's a fun thing. We're doing that. And just a lot of, a lot of other things to just stay, uh, you know, ahead of the curve and ahead of the, you know, the craziness that's been thrown our way and we've, we've had to be really adaptive as, as brands. I know all three of our brands have had to do that. And these are, you know, three really vibrant brands in Paso Robles. Um, so lots of great things are happening. If you're, if you're close enough or you're interested, I know Paso's open. We are all tasting. Um, it's just outside under shade or under umbrellas. Uh, fun, actually fun experience because in our case, you know, we're, you're amongst the vines. You're right there amongst the vineyard and um, it's, it's really fun. So, um, you know, visit us one way or the other virtually, or, um, you know, come see us, make an appointment and come see us. Right on. Thanks, Carl. I just want to mention, I really like this last comment. That oh, I was just going to say, I, yeah. I realize that you're not only winemakers, but you're also farmers, chemists, scientists, environmentalists, and much more. I think that's awesome. That's like, that's such a wonderful thing to say. And if you would have asked 10 or 15 year old me that somebody would consider me a scientist or a farmer, I would have left you out of the room. That was definitely not where I thought that my life would take me, but it's so awesome that, you know, that's kind of what we gave everyone and what people are walking away with. So it's awesome. Right on. That's cool. Yeah. I'm glad you, you noticed that and said that. Thank you, Mike, for that comment. We really appreciate it. All right. So everyone, so next week uh, we will be back with another show last week or maybe the week before i had mentioned something about doing a show on the paper street vineyard that's what we're doing uh, it's i think what's going to be a, a new iconic uh vineyard um in the past rebels region so actually i went out there the other day and shot some footage uh so we'll be showing a little bit of that and showing uh three brands who are all sourcing fruit from the Paper Street Vineyard. So that's gonna be really fun. Check it out, PasoWine.com to see the links for Zoom. Or again, if you're on Facebook, just join us on Facebook. We're gonna take a, a, a one week uh, break uh, while I get to go and have a little time on my own uh, camping with my kids. Uh, and then we'll be back August 20th with a really cool show uh, showcasing PR and journalism. Uh, in the uh, from in the wine region, and so we'll have our PR uh, person, our contractor Stephanie Tuin from New York, on along with Matt Ketman from the Wine Enthusiast Magazine and Patrick Kamiski from uh, Wine and Spirits Magazine. Uh, they've all agreed to come on and talk a little bit about PR and journalism in the wine world. So thanks, everyone. Cheers, everyone. Cheers. Cheers, you guys. Right on. We'll see you. Thanks so much, Chris. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. See everyone next time. Later.